Right. It it just depends on it depends I mean, on the size. But but the point being that it wouldn't be. I mean, you could probably stand briefly on the surface of this planet and and not die. And if it's made of ice, you could stand for a long time and be happy. It, mm-hmm. It's just a matter of how dense is the sucker. But everyone is imagining. So and and this is, I guess, where we start to run into the madcap. Speculation. Actually, you know what? Before before we get into the speculation, there's a few more <laughs> things, right? The world is tidally locked to the star. Right. And so here here's one of the frustrating things about being that close to a sun is every dynamic model we've run, unless by some random miracle, and we don't anticipate that, the planet is an absolutely perfect sphere with no deviations from perfect sphere. Uh, not one single mountain, not one anything, perfect sphere. Um, unless that perfect sphere happened, various torques over time are going to force this planet to be tidally locked the same way our moon is. This means one side of the planet is always experiencing daylight. One side of the planet is always experiencing darkness. And this means that there's a horrible wind going from one side to the other, and you get these giant convective cells. Right, you've got the the side of the planet that's being heated nonstop and the side of the planet that's being cooled nonstop. Right. And so it's it's thought, according to some weather models, that maybe, just maybe, there's a permanent rainfall, an ongoing storm on the dark side of this planet. Wow. We're, we're still figuring out weather. We can't even tell you what the weather's going to be like tomorrow on our own planet. But that's what the weather models are showing. So any life that could survive on this planet would first have to hope the planet survived the billion or so years of high energy flare activity was able to come out of it with some volatile, some water on the planet, um, has to then hope that there's a magnetic field. And it's believed that 30 day rotation of the planet, if it's tidally locked, is enough to allow for a magnetic field. So you need that magnetic field. And then once you survive all of that, even if you have the atmosphere, you have the magnetic field, you have the water, you have everything else, any life forms that exist have to then withstand this constant torrential wind and rain and everything else that's going on around it. Now, if it did have an atmosphere, though, wouldn't that help to balance out the temperature around the whole planet? I mean, we look at a place like Venus, uh, the temperature on Venus is exactly the same temperature no matter where you are on the planet. If you had a, a world just because the atmosphere is so thick that that's what's that's what's really regulating the, the the temperature across the whole planet, but you know here on Earth our our atmosphere isn't so thick, and so at night the temperature is cooler than day. At the you know near the near the equator it gets hotter, near the poles it gets cooler. What what kind of temperatures would you see on a world like this, where one side was always facing the star and one side was always away? Again, it's going to depend on how thick that atmosphere is. If the atmosphere is too thin, then you are going to end up with massive temperature differences between the two sides. If it's too thick and you have these massive convective cells, you will have a temperature gradient from one side to the other, but the temperature gradient will be much less. But then the chances of life will be much less as well because now you're baking the planet so that liquids aren't going to exist because it's just too hot for liquids. So it's this balancing act that's so annoying to try and sort out. Would you see life wanting to live around the Terminator, like at that sort of halfway point between daytime and nighttime on the on the planet? Or is that not necessary? It, it's really not necessary in many ways. Uh, life we used to think required light, but now as we're digging down, or I guess swimming down to the bottom parts of our ocean, we're finding that really it seems that what life needs most is some sort of a liquid solvent, something that allows nutrients to flow from one place to another. You need some sort of an energy source, and you need some sort of a probably temperature gradient to inspire chemical reactions to take place. Light isn't part of the requirements. Light is just one possible energy source. But if you have lava events, if you have something creating that temperature gradient, that can perhaps be the answer you need. So in other words, you're saying that the the concept of a habitability zone is is kind of misleading, that 
here on Earth, we have the habitability zone that we experience with the liquid water up at the surface of the planet. But the, the, the other one that we have is the one that's inside the Earth, the one that's right by the deep sea ocean vents, that's a completely separate biosphere, kind of connected to the, the life on the surface. But really, if the Earth got a lot colder, that would all still be there. Well, if the Earth got a lot colder, we might lose some of our geophysics and stop having volcanism. <laughs> right. So again, right. it's a trade-off. But this yeah. is where we can talk about there potentially being life on Titan, potentially right. being life on Europa. Yeah, and Enceladus and all those. Right. So, so in other words, like on the one hand, we're all focused about why this planet is so bad for the uh, for the habitability zone of Gliese five eighty one, and then on you know on the other hand, the whole concept of the habitability zone might be thrown out the window because you've got, you know, all these other ways. But I think, you know, when we think of life, we think of trees and animals roaming around the surface and using the surface of the planet. I mean, I don't think that life clinging around vents would, would, I think a lot, I mean, obviously it's life, but I think that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for cities and, you know, and some kind of, you know, elephant monsters and, you know, and and this is where Godzilla, you know. I, I'm not personally looking for elephant monsters or Godzilla. Yeah. But you know, Trees. I could deal with a good walking tree now and then. An ant would be my friend. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but this is where you need energy to have civilization. And when we start looking at these small planets or big planets compared to the Earth, but going around small stars. The sunlight that they're getting, it's not really that much in the visible. The majority of the light is in colors so far to the red that it's beyond what we can see with our own eyes. And in these infrared environments where you're constantly plunged into darkness, the amount of energy that you're going to get for photosynthesis, the amount of energy that you're going to get for solar energy, for all the major forms of energy that life has come up with to either consume in large forms or turn into energy in large forms. And and oil is really recycled dinosaurs, which consumed plants, which ate sunlight. So it all goes back to we get a lot of solar energy. This planet isn't going to be getting that really effective light. It's getting low power, cold, wouldn't even heat your hamburger effectively, infrared light from a small dwarf star. And that makes it hard to start thinking, well, in gale force winds, could trees that are in deep, 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 deep shadow effectively ever really grow, ever really evolve? And, um, Everything's so tantalizing, and we don't know the answers to so many of these questions. But the idea of an advanced civilization is one where if it is there, it's there by the grace of the fact that this planet will live for billions and billions and billions and billions of years and will have a chance to evolve much more slowly than we have the chance to evolve here on Earth. And I think that's that was the real takeaway that I, that we're hoping that people will get from this is there's there already has been a lot of bad science reporting is yeah. the reality you know and hopefully with universe today we're doing a good job of science reporting but and trying to get, put everything in perspective but but we want you as your you know as the knowledgeable ones who are listening to astronomy cast and you hear your friends talk did you hear they found life on that planet no. well you know they didn't they didn't <laughs> they you know they they found a, they found a very exciting discovery but uh, more data is necessary so let's talk about the more data then what what would you say is is next what what are scientists going to be working on next and what can we hope to hear Well, really all we can do with this system at this point is keep watching it and better refine the data we have. The problem is these planets quite annoyingly do not transit their star. This means we're never able to look at the planets as they pass through the starlight and thus study if they do or don't have atmospheres. So this little planet sits there taunting us going, na, 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 I have planets and I won't tell you anything about them. And so these planets are... I mean, you say you can't use them by the transit method. So there is no real simple technology that will ever let us see the atmospheres of these planets. No, and the star is giving off so little light that reflected light isn't really 
that much of an option, especially when these things are so close into their parent star. But what is amazing about this is we've studied so very few stars in the detail that we've studied Gliese 581 that the fact that this early into having the technique with this few stars studied, we found a system with this many planets tells us that we're looking at 10 or more percent of stars having multiple systems with habitable, possibly, planets. That is the takeaway. That's, that's the, the takeaway. Yeah, that's the, that's the real news here is that, that, that astronomers are really refining the percentages of planets of different sizes orbiting around stars of different sizes. And, you know, a decade from now, they'll have really good models on if it's a, this kind of a star, it's probably going to have this kind of a planet configuration. If it's a, that kind of star, it's probably going to have these kinds of planets. And that really helps narrow down the, the search for the habitable worlds. But, but as you know, in terms of like, will we know if this star has, has life, we're going to need for now, we're going to need those, those worlds that pass right in front of the star, obscuring it and getting us a chance to take a look at its atmosphere as it goes past. And, and that's, to me, kind of the holy grail of exoplanets is finding the planet in the habitable zone that is transiting, that is a fraction, a large fraction, like half the size of the Earth up to a couple times the size of the Earth that has that atmosphere where we can start seeing oxygen and we can start seeing pollutants that are indicating there's technology. There's a lot of people, I mean are predicting. And I think, you know, I feel pretty confident about this as well. These discoveries are going to come fast and furious. I mean, we are not far away now from being able to start detecting atmospheres around other worlds. And if, if we get lucky, you know, possibly the most important scientific discovery in human history will get made in, in all of our lifetimes. So I, I can't wait. And and as much as you and I have s- sat here and said terrestrial planet finder, terrestrial, <laughs> terrestrial planet, planet finder, finder, yeah, one of the things that this set of discoveries really shows is how powerful a tool the radial velocity technique really is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, terrestrial planet finder want, um, but the other thing we really need is a dedicated eight to ten meter telescope that does nothing but radial velocity measurements that can be out there finding the systems like this one that just might be what tell us the rest of the story. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd rather have the terrestrial planet finder. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but I know, it's, I know it's a harder sell. Anyway, well, that's great, Pamela. Thank you very much. And uh, as, as we get more uh, discoveries on this, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll sneak a few into some episodes. So we'll talk to you later. Sounds great, Fraser. Talk to you later. This has been Astronomy Cast, a weekly facts based journey through the cosmos. Show notes and transcripts for every episode are available on our website. Check it out at astronomycast.com. You can send us any comments, questions, or feedback to info at astronomycast.com. We read every email. The show is a nonprofit educational resource provided by Fraser Kane and Dr. Pamela Gay. We're supported through the kind donations of listeners like you. If you enjoy Astronomy Cast, why not give us a donation? It helps us pay for bandwidth, transcripts, and show notes. Just click the donate link on the website. All donations are tax deductible for U.S. taxpayers. You can support the show for free, too. Write a review or recommend it to your friends. Every little bit helps. Click support the show on our website to see some suggestions. To subscribe to the show, point your podcatching software at astronomycast.com slash podcast.xml or subscribe directly from iTunes. Music is provided by Travis Searle. The show was edited by Preston Gibson. Astronomy Cast is produced at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville with generous support from Universe Today.